what would you say is the optimal amount of meat that we should be eating on a weekly basis? Specifically, I guess, red meat and how would you recommend getting protein in without having too many saturated fats? Mm -hmm. Okay. Again, remember I mentioned there's a theme of eating and you'll individualize that. So we can give some broad recommendations here, but one of the things that I would be getting people to do is measure A per B. And, Blood tests. You know, I saw Gabriel Lyon, who's someone that I, I respect and have had some dialogue with back and forth, but uh, you know, I thought it was a little bit of a clickbaity style video, put up something saying, you know, red meat doesn't affect cholesterol levels. Mm -hmm. Well, this is what I'm talking about when it's, you know, when you have these bite-sized bits of nutrition information that I think we need to be really careful about is what dose of red meat are we talking about? What type of red meat? And if someone's not eating that, what are they eating instead? Because all of these things will determine the effect, for example, on ApoB. <laughs> And so uh, how much red meat in someone's diet, you know, broadly speaking, I think the recommendations of, you know, three, 400 grams of red meat in a, in a week are, are good recommendations. And I say that because when you go out and look at the research, looking at cardiovascular disease and cancer for things like unprocessed red meat, it's very easy to find a study to show that there is no association. I can do that. But you have to be very careful when you're looking at that data. What are you comparing? Because often they use the words high and low, but that's relative. So if you're comparing 70 grams a day intake with 30, like a lot of Asian populations where they don't consume a lot of red meat, you don't see any significant difference because the contrast between high and low is actually not that, that large. Mm. So exposure and exposure contrast matters a lot. When you look at the US populations and you compare low, you know, 40, 50 to high, north of 100, 150 grams, now you do start to see risk because you have sufficient contrast in the exposure. Uh, so I think that's a, you know, a general, a good general recommendation is that three, 400 grams a week, which is like what the World Health Organization and the World Cancer Research Fund uh, recommend. But then I would go a step further and say, you need to look at your blood work. Where is ApoB at? Because if I had elevated ApoB and let's, let's say I wanted to try lifestyle first before any type of pharmaceutical drug to lower that down. And I was eating a lot of red meat. Well, I can tell you there's a bunch of peer reviewed data that's reproducible. When you swap red meat for either fatty fish or for sources of plant protein that tend to be low in saturated fat and high in fiber, you do get significant reductions in ApoB. So I'm not sure if I answered your question no, completely, you did. but I'm, I'm, I guess I'm also highlighting uh, how important context is. Yeah. So when you say 300 to 400 grams, is that a steak per week, would you say? That's a large steak, I guess. Yeah. A ribeye. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> okay. Yeah. I'm currently doing a lot more than that. Yeah. So when you say fatty fish, mm -hmm. are you concerned at all about heavy metals? And do heavy metals have an impact on cholesterol level? I don't know the answer to that second part, which I know might, you know, often when people say they don't know something, it can come across as like a lack of confidence. But I actually, I went to, do you know NQ? No. He's a poet. Oh. And he said something the other night. He said, we need to repopularize the idea of, of being able to say, I don't know. I love that. <laughs> and I think we just need to know our limitations. Yeah. Right. And so I don't know if there is an association between mercury and cholesterol levels. Um, I'm interested in mercury exposure in fatty fish and how that could affect health outcomes. Mm. I can tell you the research that I've looked at, looking at particularly cognitive, long-term cognitive health, you know, because that's usually where fatty fish comes up, either cardiovascular health or uh, cognitive health, long-term dementia. Martha Morris from Rush University, she conducted a really neat study where she looked at the risk of dementia and then looked at mercury levels in the brain. Mm. And what she found was that fish, people that consumed fish regularly had higher mercury levels, 
but lower risk of dementia. So what do we do with that data? Well, for me personally, I care more about the health outcome. I care about my risk of dementia. So, you know, I don't know if that story is complete. Are mercury levels in fish changing? Um, what I do know is that the outcomes for the consumption of fatty fish seem to be positive. You have lower risk of cardiovascular disease and lower risk of dementia. And then within that, you know, sure, let's make some sens sensible choices and try and consume smaller fish where there's less bioaccumulation of, of mercury. Let's not go out of our way to, to have a lot of mercury in, in our system. That's how I would approach that. And how do you feel about farm-raised versus wild-caught? Mm. I have mixed feelings. Everyone should read a book called Toxic by Richard Flanagan. Okay. Which is a book that kind of journals the farmed salmon industry in Tasmania, in Australia. Um, I think that there's there's problems with both, to be honest. Getting getting enough DHA and EPA, which are these long chain omega threes that our body cannot make, we have to. Uh, either get them th directly in, in through our diet or a supplement or consume plant fats that our body then converts. Getting enough DHA and EPA from fish globally for everyone, I don't think it's sustainable. Hmm. I think that we would have, you know, just mass destruction of a very important ecosystem, which is unfortunate. So I think we have to come up with other solutions that a lot of, you know, uh, innovative companies are kind of working on, and and there are some like plants that are now being grown that ha that contain DHA in them that will be commercially available, and algae oil, which is like a more sustainable source than fish. Fish actually get their DHA and EPA by eating feeding on algae. Um, so yeah. Back to your question, I think if you are if you are consuming fish, then it's like mackerel and sardines and salmon, those types of fish. I don't have a, a good answer as to farmed versus wild. I think both of them have problems that we need to think about. Um, and then if you're not consuming fish regularly, and by regularly I mean two, three times a week, then you're going to be supplementing with a fish oil or an algae oil. I love fish oil. I take yeah. it every day.